Tongues of fire come down, place upon us the crown. Confusion be removed, jagged hearts be smoothed. Hear clearly now that every knee should bow. Mashiach's warriors stand tall, evil strongholds fall. We like stones from a brook, a people never forsook. Your sin causing you to grieve, repent and believe. By grace through faith be still, this is God's will. Usual welcome to Ecclesia. And um, we are looking at chapter 4 of the letter that the Apostle wrote to uh, the Ephesians, uh, the church in Ephesus. But let's first go open with a word of prayer. Amen? Amen. Heavenly Father, we, uh, we just come before you, Lord, in Jesus' name, and we ask you, uh, Lord, to have mercy on us. Uh, Lord, we have sinned in so many ways, and Lord, we have not lived up to the calling that, you have, um, that you've called us to. Uh, we thank you that you have called each of us by name, and Lord, that we uh, that we have been saved by grace through faith, and and Lord, we are trying to work this out with fear and trembling. Lord, maybe we don't even yet know what that means, but Lord, we ask you, God, to um, to open our hearts at this time. Lord, we want to receive your word. Uh, Lord, guard our hearts against things that are not from you, and. And fill our hearts with those things that are good and holy, Lord. Um, sanctify this offering uh, by your Spirit. Um, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be pleasing in thy sight and be edifying to thy people. And, um, and Lord, as we, as we grapple with these things, Lord, may our prayer lives be informed and, uh, and strengthened. And may you, uh, may you bless our families and bless the folks here at Brookdale. Um, please be with Tannis and her family. Um, Lord, also just uh, please protect us from, from anything that um, anything health-wise, Lord. We pray for health and healing and in our soul and our spirit and our body, Lord. And, and Lord, Lord, we thank you for comforting us with all comfort, Lord. And Lord, I just, uh, for the folks that can't be here this morning, Lord, please bless them and give them, uh, give them rest and Lord, we just thank you so much for your word. We thank you for your spirit, Father. And, um, and we thank you for what you have already accomplished in Christ and what you continue to accomplish in the midst of us as you stretch forth your hand for healing. Lord, that we may, uh, that we may see the Son glorified um, and the Father um, just, uh, just, Father, just show, show your love and show your power consistently through us as you do, Lord, but let us have eyes to see and ears to hear uh, what the Spirit says to the churches, Lord. Thank you, Jesus, for your grace, for your mercy. Lord, I do ask also that you would silence all, um, silence all wicked voices, Lord, and we want to hear your voice, Jesus. Um, we want to hear your voice speaking here in the midst of us, God, and we thank you, Lord. Amen. Amen. All right, so... We are looking at Ephesians chapter 4. I think we finished up with, um, with verse 12 last week, and we were talking about the gifts. You know, we talked about, first of all, living up to our calling and talked about some basics of, you know, Christianity and, you know, but we, then we started talking about the gifts of the Spirit and these things that God gives us um, at, the, uh, at the appointing of the Spirit for the purpose of building us up and giving us those things that we need. Sometimes, sometimes we need water. Sometimes we need refreshment, right? And sometimes we need rebuke. We need a little fire in our lives, right? To, to consume those things within us that are not good, amen? And as we, as we take hold of these gifts, um, we know that we have, to, we have to fan these gifts into flame. You know, Paul tells Timothy, when I laid my hands on you, God gave you a gift. Now, you have to fan that gift into flame, and if you don't, then, well, uh, hopefully we can depend on the Spirit to, to redirect our, our thought patterns and our life in such a way so that we do fan it into flame, amen? Because we know that Jesus will never lose any of his sheep, right? Because he and the Father are one. But we may not, we may not be as effective as we could be 
if we do not actively participate with God in what he's doing. If we're not constantly seeking and knocking and desiring to, to agree with God and to walk in the Spirit, then we may end up not producing as much of the fruit of the Spirit as we, as we could. And Lord knows we all want to produce good fruit, love and joy and peace and patience and kindness and goodness and gentleness and faithfulness and self-control. But we can't do those things on our own. We can only do those things by abide. We can only produce those things by abiding in Jesus. And the Spirit will teach us how to do that. And the Spirit will teach us what that looks like. Right? And that's why we get into the Word. So that, so that we can read those things that have been written so long ago for our encouragement and for our edification. So that we can be equipped for every good work. And then the Spirit reminds us of the things that Jesus told us. And he gives us those things by grace in the moment that we need it. You know, we can depend on God for that. And that's an amazing thing. So the scripture says this. It starts out with the purpose of this. And this referring to the giving of gifts to the people of God. The purpose of this is that we should all reach unity in our belief and loyalty and in knowing God's Son. So God has a purpose. So typically when we give gifts to our families on like Christmas and birthdays and stuff like that, the gift is to bring them joy, right? To bring them joy and fulfillment. And we try to give good gifts to our children. Amen? Well, how much more so our Heavenly Father? You know, if we ask our Heavenly Father for good gifts, isn't He going to give us amazing gifts? I mean, I think, I think, of, the, uh, I think of King Solomon who asked God for the gift of wisdom because he was in a position where he was going to have to lead God's great people, Israel. God was so pleased with what his request was that it was not self-centered, but it was focused on glorifying God and taking care of God's people that he ended up giving him life and riches in addition to that. So sometimes we, we start to wonder to ourselves, well, Maybe I'm just not praying and asking God for enough. But if our hearts are right and we're asking God for things that are going to bring glory to Him and, and are going to be good for not just us as individuals but for the whole community, our, our Father in Heaven is a good, good Father. He's going to give us more because He knows that our hearts are set upon those things that His heart is set upon. And so he has a purpose in giving us these gifts. And that purpose is that we would all reach unity in our belief and loyalty. Unity, oneness. So God cares about us being one church, one body of Christ. You know, the early church started arguing with one another. Well, I'm, I'm of Cephas and I'm of Paul and I'm of, I'm of John and I'm of this and I'm of that. And the apostle the Apostle Paul's like, is, is the body of Christ divided? He's like, what are you guys doing? You missed the point. You're one body. Yes, one of you might be a foot, and one of you might be an eye, and one of you might be an ear. But you need one another. You need one another to build one another up in love and to come to the unity of the faith. Can you imagine if, you're, if your left hand just basically said, I don't want to be a part of this body anymore? That's ridiculous. Right? Now, Jesus did tell us. He said, hey, listen, if, you're, if, you're, if your right eye causes you to trip up, causes you to, to sin, it's better to pluck it out and throw it away than you get your whole body thrown into, into the Gehenna, into fire. Right? But if you were somebody, you would have started to think, man, I really don't want to pluck my eye out. Right? I... That's the last thing that I want to do, right? So you would do everything you possibly could to save that eye or to save that foot or whatever, right? And, and that's where it comes to the idea of patience and long-suffering with one another. And, and living in a community requires forgiveness. You have to be willing to forgive one another and to continue to walk in truth together. Because the last thing that we ever, ever want to see 
is to have to lose one of our members. Now, there are instances in the New Testament where members of the body of Christ are excommunicated. Now, we don't practice this a whole lot in the Protestant church, not these days anyway. Right? Why? Because people will get mad and they'll just go to the church down the street. Right? But why was he excommunicated? The man was having sexual relations with his father's wife. I mean, that's a pretty serious offense. And if they excommunicated him, that means he was unwilling to repent. Because Matthew 18 gives us proceedings regarding dealing with sin, right? You go to the, if a brother or sister sins against you, you go to them and try and sort it out. If they won't, if they won't accept it and won't, won't change, then you take a couple other brothers and sisters and try and sort it out. Right? And if they still won't repent, then you take it before the whole church. And then if they still won't repent, then you excommunicate them. So I have to assume that these guys went through that process with this guy. Now, even once he was excommunicated, though, by the time you go from 1 Corinthians over to 2 Corinthians, it seems like they received him back into the community. So they handed him over to Satan for a period of time so that his flesh would be destroyed, that is his worldliness, and then they grafted him back in again. See, all of the punishment that we receive as Christians is always focused on restoring us because God doesn't want to lose anything. Right? Because in the beginning he said, he looked at everything that he made and he said it is very good. So even when we discipline a member of the body of Christ, the intention is always, always to bring healing and wholeness to them as an individual as well as the community as a whole. Amen? So the purposes of this, the purpose of this is that we would all reach unity in our belief and loyalty in our belief. The things that we believe actually matter. So this comes to the idea of Christian doctrine, right? What we believe about God, what we believe about life, what we, what we believe about, do, about living our lives together. But primarily, our belief about Jesus. You know, when I, uh, when I do, when I did Christian, uh, when I did Christian ministry in the prisons, it was ecumenical ministry. And what that means is that we had people from all different denominations. We had, we had Catholics, we had uh, Pentecostals, we had, um, uh, we had Presbyterians and Baptists. Uh, so we had non-denominational guys. So you have a team of 50 guys from all different flavors, if you will, or all different parts of the body. And we have some things that are very important to us theologically. But yet we said, you know what, if you believe that if you profess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and then you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead and you believe in the Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, basically if you believe the Apostles' Creed, then you can be on the team. That's pretty much it. If you, be if you believe the Apostles' Creed or the Nicene Creed that basically talks about the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit... If you believe that, then we can then we can do gospel ministry together. Now, if you if you don't believe in the Trinity, then we're going to have to not you know like if you're a Jehovah's Witness or something like that, you can't be on the team. Um, and so those are those are basically some those are the guidelines. Those are the the central doctrines of the faith that we believe. But there's also another list in Hebrews chapter. Um, Hebrews chapter 6, it says this, So let's leave the basic level of teaching about the Messiah and go on toward maturity. So apparently there's some basic teachings about Jesus, and then there's some more mature, like deeper stuff, right? 
So what is the basic stuff? It says, let's not repeat the performance of laying a foundation of repentance from dead works, faith towards God, teaching about baptisms, laying on of hands, the resurrection of the dead, and eternal judgment. So that's, you know, when we talk, in Christianese, we talk about spiritual milk. You know, when, when, a when a person first learns of Jesus and actually believes, then we want, just like a newborn baby, we want to give them milk because it's going to have all the nourishment that their, that their newly born or reborn spirit needs in order to not be blown this way and that way by every wind of doctrine. So these are some central things, according to the author of Hebrews, that we should be pretty solid and pretty firm in, you know, before we start getting into some of the deeper things of Christ. Amen? And so when we're working with, uh, with one another and, and building one another up in the faith, we want to make sure that those foundational concepts are understood or presented, you know, so that we really have a working knowledge of what that looks like in our walk with Christ. A lot of times, uh, if you start going to a church, they'll have like a... Uh, Christianity 101 or a new disciples a new disciples class or something like that and it really should it really should cover those topics right and so so those are some things that maybe maybe the folks in feet in Ephesus really weren't that firm on because with all the disunity that they were having and everything like that they may have lacked a fear of God they may have been being tossed this way and that by different winds of teaching different, you know, false prophets and different um, demonic angels and fallen angels, all sorts of stuff could, could get us off track, right? Because we're in a war. Everybody understands that, right? We are in a spiritual battle. That's true. And that means we have to contend for the faith and maintain our joy in the Lord and, our, and continue to celebrate the salvation that we have in Christ. And so it says... The purpose of this is that we should all reach unity in our belief. So those central things are important that we are unified in those foundational truths. And then on top of those foundational truths, because we can have no other foundation than Christ Jesus, right? So on top of those foundational truths, then we can start to build our house with some of the deeper things of God. Although if we are building, we want to make sure that we're building with good materials. Why? Because persecutions will come and a lot of that was happening in Ephesus and so if persecutions come we may find ourselves in situations where we may be tempted or someone may be trying to force us to recant our faith and we have to be steadfast even unto the end right absolutely absolutely and if our faith is weak and we're more concerned about our flesh than we are about eternal things then we may fold in that moment, right? You guys that have been in the military, you guys are trained. If you get caught behind the enemy lines and you, they start torturing you and this and that in order to give up some, some location or something like that, so it would cost the lives of your brothers, that would be a problem, right? Well, in the same, in the same way, we want to make sure that we are strong in our Christian faith because there are, there are Christians in the world today that are being beheaded, they're being thrown in prison. They're, they are being treated horribly. Why? Because they believe in Jesus and, and they live behind enemy lines. And those are, we need to pray for them. Those are our soldiers. Those are our ambassadors who are in the field. And they need our prayers and our support. Our belief and loyalty in knowing God's Son. So our loyalty, once we were born again, we're no longer of this world. So our loyalties completely change. Our loyalty is now to a king and a kingdom. Jesus being the king, and then the kingdom being the kingdom of God. That's why it says make your first priority God's kingdom and his way of life. And so that's difficult when we have a bunch of different people from different cultures and different backgrounds coming together as one family because we have things that we grew up in. We were taught certain things and we, certain things had our attention and had our affections 
But all of that attention and all of that affection is then to be shifted to Jesus, to the king and the kingdom. And in knowing God's son. So he doesn't want us to have this blind faith, this pie in the sky Jew that got crucified 2,000 years ago that he wants us to know, to know God's son. He wants us to have an intimate relationship with the word of God. And that means that we have to be intentional about building that relationship. How? Well, the early church devoted themselves to four things. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to the prayers. So as we devote ourselves to those things, somehow our intimacy and our relationship with God in knowing Jesus, His Son, Somehow that grows, and the more time you spend doing those things, the more you will find yourself learning how to love Jesus and to love people well. Then we shall reach the stature of the mature man, measured by the standards of the king's fullness. So how we function corporately as a group of people, reflects the maturity that we have as one body of believers. And so, if we're growing up in maturity, we begin with the pure milk of the word, right? And along the way, we have different challenges. So suddenly, all of a sudden, we learn to try and maybe take a couple steps and walk a little bit, right? We might stumble a little bit, that's okay. But we get back up and we keep on learning to walk and we might need to, to lean on mom and dad a little bit while we're learning to walk. And then eventually, you know, we're running around the house and climbing on stuff and all sorts of stuff. And next thing you know, we're building tree forts. And the next thing you know, we're, you know, next thing you know, we're driving. And the next thing you know, we're off to college and we're really learning things. And next thing you know, we're actually being really productive um, members of the kingdom, Right. And so it's, it's a growing up. Now, all of that does not happen apart from Jesus. As we walk with Christ, as we, as we walk with Jesus, everything that we need, everything that we do is empowered by him, is guided by him. As we learn to choose the good in every situation. See, you can do a lot of really good things in your life. You can do a lot of good things in your life, but the problem is, if you're so busy doing a lot of good things, you may be missing the one great thing that God wants you to do. That's why we have to slow down, listen, pray, discern what God's will is, right? Because we can be doing so many things that nothing really good gets done because we miss out on the great thing that would really bring glory to God. And that's the, that's the idea, right? Not to just be busy, but to bring glory to God. Amen? Then we shall reach the stature of the mature man measured by the standards of the king's fullness. That mean, you know, you think about Jesus, the, I mean, he was fully God and fully man. That means the intimacy and the relationship that he had with the Father was so amazing that there was no separation. Jesus even says, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Like, that's a pretty bold statement. Right? Yeah. So, what, so if we grow into the mature man, what does it say? It says... As a result, we won't be babies any longer. Well, that's a good thing, right? I mean, I know a lot of people who are like hardcore, like, um, like born-again Christians, right? They're like, you know, fire and brimstone, you need to be born again, da da da, da you know? Well, it's great to be born again, but then you got to get on with the business of living. And that means, take, you know, that means being eager for that pure milk of the word, and that means learning how to be the part of the community, and that means learning to seek the deeper things of God, and then you'll move on to those things if God allows you, right? And so, but as a result, you won't be babies any longer. You won't be thrown this way and that on a stormy sea, blown about by every gust of teaching, 
by human tricksters, by their cunning and deceitful scheming. Now, if you go back to the, um, if you go back to the Sermon on the Mount where Jesus was teaching, at the end of that teaching, he says, listen to me. He says, if you, if you build your house on this foundation, that is the teaching of the Sermon on the Mount, if you're a wise man, you're going to do these things. And that's how you're going to build your house. And then when the winds and the waves come and beat on that house, it's not going to fall. Why? Because it was, it was built on the foundation. Right? It was built on a solid foundation. He dug deep and he built a solid foundation. So when the storms and the winds and all that sort of stuff come against it, at the end of the day, the house is still going to be standing. Well, it's, it's, Paul's basically expounding on that here, saying, listen... We won't be babies any longer. We won't be thrown this way and that on a stormy sea blown about by every gust of teaching, human tricksters, and by their cunning and deceitful scheming. So when, we talk, when Jesus is talking about the winds and the waves coming against the house, this is what he's talking about. Right? Now, the foolish man is going to hear the things from the Sermon on the Mount and then not do them and not build his house according to them. Right? And then these things are going to happen. You're going to have stormy winds, which are angel or winds would be equating to angels, um, teachings, human tricksters, uh, cunning and deceitful scheming. You're going to get knocked off your horse, man, and not in a good way, right? You're going to get sidetracked. You're going to be like the what, you're going to be like Christian in that in, the, in that book, uh, Pilgrim's Progress, right? You're going to get people showing up trying to take you this way and that and get you off course. We don't want that. We want to be. We want to stay steadfast. So, instead, we must be. We must speak the truth in love, and so grow up in everything into Him that is into the King, who is the Head. He supplies the growth that the whole body needs, linked as it is and held together by every joint which supports it, with each member doing its own proper work. Then the body builds itself up in love. So, not only do we have to have that that solid foundation and build our, build our foundation according to the teachings of Jesus, right? But we also want to be built in such a, such a way where we are prepared to handle these gusts of wind and these, these tricksters and all these sorts of things, right? And so then what do we want to do to do that, to accomplish that? Well, speaking the truth in love. We have to genuinely have concern for one another. And if we genuinely have concern for one another, then the things that we speak into one another's lives are going to be for their good, for their upbuilding, for their nourishment, to, to empower them and to encourage them to be able to stand and to stand firm in the truth. Amen? Instead, we must speak the truth in love and grow up in everything into Him. That is into the king who is the head. So your head is the place where you get instruction from. Your head is the place that leads you and guides you, your, right? And so we need to have our minds renewed so that we have the mind of Christ. And that happens as we engage our hearts and our minds with Jesus. Because remember, it's not just your mind. It has to be your heart too. Because why? We build one another up in love. So I can just I can speak a whole lot of intellectual doctrine to you, but if I don't have a genuine love for you and a genuine concern for your growth in Christ, then my words are going to be empty. But my words, I want them to be filled with grace and truth. Because then there will be a supernatural power to build your spirits up and to refresh you and to equip you to be strong in the faith and to stand firm in the face of all opposition, and to continue to fight the good fight, standing firm in all that is good and true and holy. He, that is the head, Jesus, supplies the growth that the whole body needs. So one of us may plant, another will water, but ultimately it's God who causes the growth, right? Right? And the, worker, the workers who build will receive their reward. But ultimately, all glory goes to God. Because he's the one who causes, he's the one who supplies the growth that the whole body needs. That, the whole body needs growth. 
That means none of us has come to a point where we're so mature in our faith that we don't need another spiritual meal. Right? You, you guys eat every day, right? Hopefully. Everybody's getting fed in here. All right. So everybody needs to have food every day to be nourished. How much more so spiritually? Linked as it is and held together by every joint which supports it. So we are all one. There's one spirit that holds us all together. That encourages us. It's one spirit that makes us. You know, it's not our ability to, to negotiate with one another. It's the Holy Spirit that makes us one and links us together. Held together by every joint which supports it, with each member doing its own proper work. So there is work for us to do in Christ. But it is work that is spirit-empowered, it is work that is spirit-led, and it is work that is spiritual in nature... Now, will that result in external fruit in a manifestation of love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, self-control? Yes, absolutely. But it's a spiritual thing. So we speak. when I speak, I'm speaking to your spirit so that your spirit's being built up and then your spirit can inform your, your, your mind and then your mind or your body and all that gets kind of works that way, right? Always, like I said, heaven is like the CEO's office of earth. Right? So your spirit, the spirit of Christ that lives in you, is what guides everything that you do. So that's, that's who I'm speaking to, is your spirit. Then the body builds itself up in love. So as we sow spiritual things, as we sow to the spirit, then our body gets built up at every level. Spiritually, emotionally, intellectually, even physically, we are strengthened. So this is, uh, this is an amazing thing. Uh, may our prayers this week reflect a desire for us to grow and to mature into the fullness of Christ as his body. And may the Lord show us by his spirit what that looks like for us in different scenarios and situations. Amen? Amen. We have, we have a song, the spirit of the living God, fall afresh on me. That's one of the psalms. Yeah, okay, cool. Amen. And we do. We need the spirit of the living God to fall fresh upon us. Amen. Let's pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our sins as we now forgive those who have sinned against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. 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 Cool. I appreciate your knowledge of how you can speak without any notes. Oh, okay. I really do. <coughs> you don't have any notes there, but you, you, just have every, you know exactly what to say at the right time. I think God gives that to me. <laughs> I, <laughs> I hope so. <laughs> Tongues of fire come down, place upon us the crown. Confusion be removed, jagged hearts be smoothed. Hear clearly now that every knee should bow. Mashiach's warriors stand tall. Evil strongholds fall We like stones from a brook A people never forsook Your sin causing you to grieve Repent and believe By grace through faith be still This is God's will 